going to step back <laughs> and, and yeah. try and, and give a, uh, 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 just a real short, um, more simpler understanding, because uh, even some of what he said went over my head uh, real quickly. Um, so you got your website, and it's sitting on a server somewhere, uh, probably in like Dallas. Uh, I don't know why there are a lot of servers in Dallas. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, distance actually matters. Um, if you're sitting on an internet connection right next to this server, uh, you're going to have a really fast connection back and forth. Uh, but if you are you know, in North Carolina, it's going to be a little slower. If you're in Hong Kong, it's going to be a lot slower. Because what's happening is the, uh, all the information is just get, getting bounced back and forth. So what Patrick mentioned is that you want to be close to the location where that content is being delivered from. And so what Cloudflare does and these other content delivery networks is, is sit between your website server and uh, the end user. And they distribute your site and all of its content um, uh, across the globe to data centers just everywhere. Uh, I don't know. Do you know how many Cloudflare has? Uh, I don't. Yeah. I, I, but it's it's just tons, um, and because of that, it means that if you're uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, when you try and go to one of Patrick's personal sites, uh, you probably don't get served up from his actual web host. You pick up a cached copy. Uh, cache is just um, they visited the site and made a copy of it and stored it locally. Uh, you're getting a cached copy from a data center that's real close to us. 151 data centers. Is how many 151. They have. Wow. Um, the website says 152 right now. What's that? They just added one the other day. <laughs> really? Yeah, I just went there. <laughs> yeah. I Googled it. Uh, Still says 151 for me. Well, that, you only get 151. Uh, yeah, he, gets, he gets 152. He gets 152. Uh, but they've become even more um, impressive. And I think uh, we're going to go out of order a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, I'm going to scroll down a bit and point out. really matter what it means, but there was HTTP 1 and then 1.1, and now there's a new one called 2. And it has a lot of different features in it, um, but one of it, I, is it called multiplexing? Is that yeah. the, the word for it? Okay. Um, so it, it used to be the case that when you would start a connection to a website, and it would download your, the, the HTML code that you have on the page, but then there's also JavaScript and pictures and maybe videos. And it would essentially download these things one at a time, one right after the other. And depending on the way the browser's politeness was set, so like some browsers or, uh, could, could download a couple more at the same time. But for the most part, every time it would send a request, and it would do some sort of like handshake back and forth and then say, yes, this is the data that I want, and then it would send it, it would complete it, and then it would move on to the next thing. That was HTTP 1. Well, that's really, really slow. Um, time until finally the page is done. Well, HTTP2 uh, has added this thing called multiplexing, which allow allows you to start the connection and then uh, download many resources simultaneously, um, as opposed to waiting for individual ones to complete. Um, and it does it in a way uh, that is hopefully polite enough not to uh, take down your server because you're downloading stuff too fast. Uh, but uh, the technology is beyond me, but What's really amazing about a service like Cloudflare, uh, a content delivery network, um, is that they'll actually add HTTP to uh, uh, 
compatibility for free and automatically to your site. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, Cloudflare itself is free. Um, so when th there are certain features that you can get beyond the free version with Cloudflare, of course, it's a freemium model, uh, but uh, you can automatically speed up your site by using Cloudflare, not only by uh, delivering your content uh, to your users from a closer location, but also by taking advantage of new technologies that they're just placing on top of uh, your existing site. So um, it's, it's hard, it, it's really hard to justify not using a CDN these days. Yes? Um, when you say Cloudflare is free, um, we all know about Facebook being free. The question is how does Cloudflare monetize their free gear? Sure. Uh, they, to my knowledge, um, they, they don't really monetize their free tier very much. Uh, they make it uh, very valuable to move up. Um, the, the next couple of tiers, and I can't remember what all of the, um, the right. various features are that they add. And at some point in the future, they might put the screws on and, and, and try and make you pay for it. I, I, I think it's, it's worth it. I mean, if it were nine ninety nine a month, I'd pay for it. It's even if it were, weren't free. Don't but tell them that. But there's also <laughs> uh, there's also uh, maxcdn.com, which I also I believe has a free tier as well. Um, but fastly and yeah, fastly. a dozen others. Yeah, there's a whole bunch um, similar to this now coming out, and uh, it's at the point where this is probably the easiest improvement that you can make to your site. It, uh, it, it requires only um, making a change to your DNS, which you'll do uh, through whoever you registered your website with. Um, and uh, a support representative there can help walk you through the process. Um, I know for Cloudflare, for example, they've got uh, tutorials on how to do it for like 50 different registrars. So if you used GoDaddy or Diamond or DNS Easy or whoever, chances are it. Um, they, they, they know how to do it and they've got to walk through it for you. Uh, so uh, the, the next one up on our list to discuss uh, is more on diagnosing. And uh, the question was uh, how to find pages in GA that report uh, um, slow page loads. And are any of those important pages? Um, I didn't know if you wanted to pull this one up on yours. Uh, the only thing I have access to is Boz, and I don't think I should <laughs> share Boz. You should not share that. Um, I don't have anything set up besides the default testing. Well, then we'll do this. Uh, slow pages in default. I can't spell that. There we go. If you use Google Analytics, like they report, I think the default is one out of 100 users and show you the timing for that. Um, JR is a big fan of this because you can turn it up and say, hey, record everyone. Uh, I have a little something different that I use because it's a bigger website. What do you use? The Chrome User Experience Report. Okay. Which is data, like if you, if you um, choose to share your data when you install Chrome, Basically, all that data is being recorded. Right now, I think the Chrome User Experience Report pulls from the top 10 million websites and will show actual user time. And people that are using Chrome, the data is being recorded for the top websites. It's one of the things that uh, Google will be using to judge your mobile website speed. Uh, it's one of the things they've announced officially that they will be judging you on. Uh, one of the interesting oh, things. Is a question. Uh, oh, yes. I wonder, do they scale that based on, um, you know, the user's networking interface? The user's networking interface? Yeah. yeah how I mean, fast the user is, yeah. yes. So it's, it's, the data that's in there is basically done by desktop, mobile, tablet. It's across, uh, you know, the connection speed, 3G, 4G, cable, et cetera, uh, even broken down by different countries. We'll, we'll show some, some of that. We will? Yeah. How are we doing that? I got that. Oh, you're going to show that now? Not now. Let's keep going. Uh, I did want to point out something interesting here. Uh, you don't work together. 
No, 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 and I'm going to chew them out for making me look bad. Uh, no. uh, what's interesting here is it, notice which one of the uh, browsers is the slowest. You notice it's Android browser. Okay. Uh, and what's interesting is that um, two, two things that are worth noting about this particular report. Wait, that's the fastest, isn't it? No, it says that it's 10 seconds. <laughs> average okay. time. I'm yeah. looking at the six seconds. I can't see very well from here, sorry. Uh, so what's interesting about, about this is um, when thinking about site speed, you have to think about your particular audience. Um, and it, it's going to change the relative importance. Um, so knowing in analytics, and you can use analytics to do this, what percentage of your uh, customer user base um, is mobile versus desktop is going to be a really big deal. Mm -hmm. So you can see uh, 10 seconds is uh, almost double uh, what the average connection is, or, or page load speed is for these other browsers which are non-mobile. Um, so Android is, is uh, definitely slower for these users, it's likely because they're on 3G connections and not on Wi-Fi or wired uh, connections. Another thing that you'll find is that there are certain types of technologies that you might have on your site that simply aren't as fast in one browser versus another. Uh, quite famously last week, uh, the um, head of the Mozilla Foundation uh, came out complaining that Google had updated YouTube in a way that uh, made it so that YouTube was much slower for all browsers other than Chrome. Uh, by actually using old technology that had since been ab abandoned by all browsers except for Chrome. Um, and so the deprecated version was slower on, uh, on Mozilla and on um, Edge and Internet Explorer. Uh, so these types of nuances um, you can catch if you look in your Google Analytics page feed report. And if you do see that one particular browser is kind of sticking out, um, and it's not something as obvious as, oh, that, that's a mobile browser, uh, then you might want to talk to your developer to, to try and identify or pinpoint what it is in particular. It's normally something related to either uh, JavaScript or CSS implementations um, that, that's causing uh, the, the actual page load speed to slow down. Um, is there anything else you wanted to go over on the Google Analytics? Um, yeah, just discovery? if anyone's interested, like you can turn up your sample rate. It's 1% by default, but you can say like, I want data from 100% of my users. Don't do that forever, because it's, <laughs> it's gonna slow things down. But uh, it's not a bad way to get real user data. The only alternative is really the Chrome user experience report, and that's uh, only gonna be for larger sites right now. Yeah, and uh, following up with that briefly, um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, tools that might be useful, uh, Sitebulb, um, anybody here use Sitebulb? It's a fairly new to the market. I think it's Sitebulb, B-U-L-B. Uh, it's fairly new to the market. I want to say it's maybe six to nine months old. Um, it's a little older than that, but so. yeah. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna have a bet here. Anyone use Screaming Frog? It's one of their competitors. Oh. They have some cool visualization stuff. Uh, are they really not gonna tell us? I think it's, <laughs> we're gonna find this out and we're gonna fight. Uh, you can look at their documentation. He releases, like the release notes are pretty comprehensive. more than a year. All right, you win. All right. Okay. Uh, so one of the great things about Sitebulb is that uh, it can crawl your site using a, uh, in, using a full browser. Um, so instead of just uh, hitting the pages and downloading the HTML, it'll actually interact or move through your site as if it were a real user. And uh, it will report back uh, Lighthouse metrics, which are a new brand 
of uh, page speed metrics that Google has developed to help give you a much better idea of what the user experience is. So it's, it's one thing to say, when does the page actually complete? And it's another thing to say, when can I actually start interacting with the page? And light, er, the, these Lighthouse metrics allow you to um, do that, or er, allow you to see many things uh, related to, for example, when is um, the, the first bite that the user gets to, when is the first time they see uh, what they call first meaningful paint, which means the, the page kind of looks laid out to uh, first, I can't remember, is it first inter interactivity or something? First interactive. First interactive, when can they actually start doing things with the page? Um, and each one of these are important metrics in understanding uh, when your users are abandoning your site. So what you can do is actually uh, get an idea of uh, by, or at what point people are leaving relative to each one of these different um, measurements and then try to Im improve the different measurements. But long story short, Sitebulb is a great tool in that it can actually provide you all of these metrics across your entire site. Um, and I believe it is, it, there's a freemium model, so there's a free trial. Um, I don't know how long it lasts. I think it's 14 days. So it's worth a shot um, to use. Uh, do you really want to talk about uh, Google Chrome or <laughs> console uh, for, for assets? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's the possibility that uh, your pages um, on your site are actually trying to pull in uh, pictures, images, JavaScript, CSS, etc., that you don't need or that is no longer there. And that can slow down your connection. Um, those types of errors tend to be fairly rare. Um, uh, just real quickly, who is familiar with uh, uh, developer tools for Chrome? We'll just take a, a look real fast. Um, we're going to go to a, a particularly terrible site, IBM.com. Oh, God. Uh, and, <laughs> and see what happens. It's funny because I've been pulling up examples of Moz. Uh, <laughs> uh, please don't. Uh, it'll be just as embarrassing. Uh, uh, so I'm actually using Opera uh, browser here, but it's based on Chrome, so it looks the same. Uh, but basically, when you load the site, uh, if you go to uh, developer and then developer tools, we lost the feed. There we go. We got it back. Uh, you can see all sorts of great information. If you notice, here's this uh, famous waterfall that I was talking about of different things loading at different times. Um, I assume you're behind the CDN, but uh, multiplexing can only do so much. It can't download everything at the same time. Uh, and certain things fire at different points. Um, uh, but you can look at the status code of different elements on the page, and if some of them are 404 ing that means that that element isn't there. Looks like you got them all, uh, which is great. Is 304 not my, what was 307? Uh, that's for, um, uh, most of the time it's, it's uh, for HSTS these days. Okay. It used to be like temporary redirect similar to 302, uh, but for yeah. the most part now it's just for upgrading the secure. Cool. Um, okay, interesting. These. <laughs> but they're not modified, which is no. a, a, a good. Uh, um, it's because you got you, um, IBM.com has a special setup for languages around the world. If you go to IBM.com and you're in Israel, you're going to get the Israeli homepage. If you go in Australia, you're going to get the Australian homepage. In the U.S., we get the USEN homepage. It's, it's offloading basically based on your location. Uh, but I, I do think this actually brings up an important point here that's worth uh, uh, noticing. Um, and this is a, a, a little technical uh, beyond what, um, you know, the first types of steps that you would take. But uh, taking advantage of the appropriate status code for various elements on your page matters. 
Um, so if you notice, they're delivering a 304 not modified header. And what that's telling the browser is that this, this item has not changed, which means that the next time it comes back, it, when it does a head check, it could choose not to re-download the file um, because it hasn't been modified since the last date. Now that can also be done with cache control headers and some other techniques. Um, but if you're only always using a 200 OK, which is the standard, uh, yep, we're here, we've got the file ready for you to download, then uh, there's no indication to the bot or to the user uh, that this content is the same as it was the last time, and they might have to refetch it. So, uh, what is sanitycheck.io? I have no idea. What is uh, it called? Sanitycheck.io? A lot of this was from JR. He's not here. <laughs> He's also no longer friends with either me or Patrick. <laughs> uh, so, start for free. Yeah, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's got Cyrus's picture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, the, the recommendation here is to run Lighthouse metrics. So here is run a Lighthouse metrics on their website before. Anybody? Cool. Patrick. Patrick asked, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, Lighthouse is still pretty new, but it's basically cutting edge for the data that you get around performance. There's really okay. only a few options that Google makes available to people. Uh, Lighthouse is the most yeah, cutting edge, I would say. Web page test, has anyone used that before? From Patrick being in these examples? Probably. Okay, or GT metrics, or Pingdom, yeah. or yeah. any of those to test your website speed. Oh, yeah. What do I get? Go to to get it again. To what? Lighthouse metrics. Audits. Yeah. Okay. The Google cache. So, this is a uh, blog of mine. Uh, don't ever read it. I'm going to point out that Russ has set for emulation as mobile, and uh, 3G um, with CPU download. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as we pointed out earlier, uh, you can go to Tools and then Developer Tools in Chrome. Yeah. And then you can choose Audits. And then Emulation allows you, I'm going to go back to Desktop. I'm, I'm going to choose No Throttling, so it's going to work at whatever the speed is here on the Frontier Network. And Clear Storage means that um, it's going, like right now, I've already cached this page. I just visited it. But by clearing storage, it's going to reload the pages if I've never been there before. Okay. And it's going to perform an audit. Um, and it's going to check a whole bunch of different things, including some SEO stuff for us. Uh, so I'm going to say, if you're going to do this normally, also do it in private. Because like any plugins that you have installed can affect your speed. If you're using something like Ghostery or whatever, like things that will run checks in the background, it'll also be running checks on this. So if you want to clear test to it, like in, in private incognito browsing. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so there's a whole lot of information here to preserve, uh, to look at. You know, the, the first thing is just some general metrics like uh, how we did on performance, accessibility, best practices, um, SEO, et cetera. As is common, you know, I got a hundred is to mine. Uh, but Take apparently, a link from that website. apparently, I'm not very progressive. Uh, uh, but but at any rate, um, there's some really cool stuff that unfortunately is not doing a good job. Uh, but what's neat here, you can. I'm just going to point it out. It should. I don't know why it's uh, so shrunken. Uh, and, and not looking right. Um, but you can see it shows you uh, at different millisecond marks what the user is seeing. And it's not until 914 milliseconds that 
do you actually see anything on the page? Um, and that's because there's this giant background image that's waiting to load. Um, uh, and you'll notice it's actually at 820 milliseconds that that occurs, and that's what we call first meaningful paint. So right here it says first meaningful paint, 820 milliseconds, and that's right here on the graph, and that's where you see that first picture start to occur. Under that, though, is first interactive beta, or first interactive. And that's where a user can actually start interacting with the page. So even though at 820 milliseconds there's a picture up there, if I tried to click on the scroll bar or something, the browser wouldn't be ready for me. and Nothing would happen. It would take another half second or so for me to actually be doing something. And consistently interactive beta happens at the same time. Um, those do, you get, do you get Slack messages here? Mm -hmm. those, yes. What? On this computer? If I send you this on Slack, it will show up. Yeah, I don't know if that's safe, though, because I don't really trust you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sending you porn. It's OK. Just to visualize this a little better. Good job. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, oh, good job. Is it the dot on the end? Patrick is a talented, uh, no one doesn't like people. I did, but it's the dot. Did you remove the dot? I didn't click there, there were no dots. There's a dot at the end. <laughs> there we go. That's cool. Um, so, uh, as you, uh, as Patrick has pointed out, I don't know where this came from. Did you make this? No, I didn't make this. I yeah, you don't Googled make anything. It. You don't make anything. <laughs> You can see that the, the navigation begins. First paint, that's the first anything shows. First contentful paint, uh, which you know, some of this stuff is not very well defined. Uh, but first meaningful paint um, is really their attempt at saying, OK, now the user feels like they're starting to see something on the page that, that you know, gives them an idea. And then when it's visually ready, and then when they can interact with it, and then when it's essentially fully loaded. Um, the what I've since lost now um, because I'm not in the right thing. Uh, the consistently interactive beta, if I'm correct, will almost always be the same, um, except if you are uh, lazy loading or waiting till on scroll for certain things below the uh, below the fold. Um, at least that's what I've seen. Have you seen them? The consistently interactive. Yeah, versus first interactive beta. Have you seen them differ before in other cases? That's a good question. I don't know the yeah. answer to that. Um, uh, but then they start giving you some recommendations like uh, reduced render blocking style sheets. Uh, I'll give you an example. That render blocking style sheet, remember how I said the first meaningful paint is like a whole second into it? That's because when you load the style sheet, the style sheet then tells you, here's the background image, and that background image has to download. And so it's the style sheet itself is render blocking because we have to download the style sheet before we can even start to download the image. Um, and so what they're recommending there is uh, perhaps you should load the uh, background image um, either separately like inline in the page uh, so that you don't have to wait for the whole style sheet to download before you can begin that. The next one is render blocking scripts, which is a, a really common problem. We'll talk about some of these later um, as well. Uh, Off-screen images, I don't even know what those, actually I do know what those are, and they are very black out. Um, uh, those, are <laughs> those are some uh, tests I was running. Uh, um, but then it, it just gives you a bunch of other very useful information on ex or accessibility, some best practices, uh, and some basic SEO tests. Failed audits. I'm sorry? Failed audits. Oh, yeah. The, the, tons of failed. I mean, look at this. I'm a horrible That's SEO. It's like, why should I support mobile? Yeah. I don't use legible font sizes. Everybody knows legible font sizes is like the number one ranking factor. Uh, Apparently, that's an important part of SEO, according to Google. Cool. Uh, 
So let's uh, pull up what's next in uh, JR's list for us to go over. Um, <laughs> What is request? I don't know what that is. Let me steal the cable for a second. You steal the cable. Okay, cool. So has anyone used PageSpeed Insights before? This is basically your best practices from Google. A lot of the same stuff that Russ just went over, render blocking scripts, optimize images, all that stuff. Um, usually shows up here, except when I do an origin search. Whoops, let's try that again. Does anyone want to volunteer a website, actually? Didn't I already? <laughs> you want to use that one? Okay. Go for it, I don't care. Was it uh, triangle beer scene? Yeah, you gotta do forward slash though. Oops. Yeah, double. There you Thank go. Thank you. I had already done this. <laughs> we planted someone in the audience for this. Um, oh, was I supposed to <laughs> spontaneously come up with no. that? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, so it gives you some data initially, like this speed here. If you're you know, in the this is from the Chrome user experience report. We don't have the optimization score because we ran this different like origin or or a uh, site colon. Um, pause. We'll show you basically like domain level metrics. So for moz.com, the average speed on mobile is 1.6 seconds till the first content will paint the first time like contents there, and 2.4 seconds till the DOM content loaded. And they give you whole like distributions to say, are you fast, are you average, or are you slow? Uh, and it's the same for desktop. The numbers change, but otherwise it's, it's the same deal. Uh, this gives you the exact opposite. This gives you like optimization. So for triangle beer scene, like we're looking 63 out of 100 on mobile, but it kind of tells you what you should fix also. So Russ had mentioned render blocking scripts. There's a ton of them here. A ton of them. Why do you have so many scripts on this website? To ask the person who developed the template. It's a template. Okay. <laughs> that explains it. And like 10 different style sheets, too. Um, so, like, all this stuff has to be downloaded before like anything can happen. So, what would happen on this website when we go to it? Like, before anything happens, it has to download a ton of different stuff. And I'm going to use a different website because this is faster. Uh, basically, all the stuff <laughs> between <laughs> all, all the stuff that's blocking will have to be loaded before it lets other stuff work. This is the waterfall that Russ was talking about. Uh, this is for moz.com, and there's a lot of stuff up here like JavaScript files that kind of have and fonts looks like that have to load before like the content of the page actually starts showing. I'm not sure if that's actually the case on Moz or yeah, they're the clearly blocking. not. Uh, web, I'm pretty sure webpagetest.org doesn't um, accept HTTP two. Yeah, they do. Now we're in Lighthouse audits for you too, oh, by the way. Because we're on Cloudflare, so it should be good. But but Google it still takes a while it. to download this stuff. Like yeah. this render blocking, it still has to download them first. Sure. So it's trying to download them in batches here. You can see it grabbed a few of these, but it needs those to load and process before it like starts the next iteration. So you'll see like segments where you know now we start downloading more stuff, whereas it should request like all of it at once. But it's not quite how it works because if the scripts are blocking the render, like there's there's different ways you can do it. If you can defer the JavaScript like so that it loads after all the HTML and images, um, then you won't see too much of an issue except if you have some functionality that relies on that. If you make them async, then it tries to download them in line. So it'll try and download all the stuff at once, but when that finishes downloading the JavaScript, it still has to process each thing. So things can go kind of screwy with async JavaScript. Like if there's any dependencies on other stuff, it might not load it because it's trying to load stuff as it goes. Uh, but it still needs to pause the HTML download while 
it's processing the JavaScript. So there's a difference between the download and the processing of the well, files. You, this request map thing that JR mentioned is awesome. Go, yeah. put, go put requestmap.com. That looks exactly like the request map that's in uh, WebPage tests here. <laughs> that is awesome. I don't know why he's using something different. Uh, if you notice it's on Heroku app, that might be. It's very similar. But click on one of those things in like the middle just to kind of give an example. You see that one request then shoots off all of those other requests. So it looks like, oh, I've only put one piece of JavaScript on my page. Well, what's actually happening is that one JavaScript include then includes several other JavaScript includes, and then that might include more. And so it ends up creating this cascading effect of slowing down your web page. Yeah, JavaScript is probably the number one killer of web pages these Where'd days. You guys find this? Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. That's Better for CSS. The request map in web page uh, test is I just right here. I never noticed that. I had never seen that. Uh, I think they only added it a few months ago. Uh, Click well, on the super useful for probably Ooh. pretty much everyone. I mean, it looks exactly the it same. It does look, it look y'all can't see Russ's screen, but it looks exactly the same as what he's got. Yeah, mine's looking at HTTP. Let me put in HTTPS and see if. I like simplicity, so JR had like a ton of tools listed. I mainly use two. Uh, that being web page test because it runs Lighthouse also. So hey, we have synthetic benchmarks. Web page test lets you configure and say, I want this on 3G, on 4G, on. Look, it says built by Simon at the bottom, and so does mine. <laughs> yeah. View on web page test .org. Yeah. So this is actually it must be owned and run by the same company. But yeah, you can choose like That's locations, funny. devices, like however you want to do synthetic um, testing around the world. So we get that, we get the lighthouse based on the settings that are there also. The only other thing I mainly use is PageSpeed Insights, which we showed earlier, because they're, they're more like a best practices and optimization score, so where did I have one? I had a PageSpeed Insights somewhere. I guess I have one right here. Um, so like it gives me this score for optimization, and then it gives me real world data, which we talked about getting with uh, Google Analytics a little bit. But this page speed that's here for major sites uh, comes from the Chrome user experience report. Again, that's, that's the best data that I've ever seen because it's real world user data. Um, I use that to like show that, uh, I got some examples here, I'll just go through real quick. But like first content for paint. This is month over month. Are we making improvements? Yes. You know, up is good in this case. Uh, same thing, but for uh, which ones they bucket into slow. Are we making improvements? Well, less people are slow. So that's a good thing. The DOM content loaded, like that's more closer to the interactive stuff. It's when, when stuff is finally processed. Again, like you can show month over month Am I making improvements? Yes, people are getting faster. Yes, less people are slow. So like this is really helpful for me and an enterprise to say, the stuff we're doing is working. We're making our website faster. You, actual users are seeing our website faster. We're actually seeing an improvement in the amount of users tracked. Because guess what? Your analytics doesn't fire instantly. It takes a while. If someone leaves, if they click and they bounce, and that hasn't fired, they don't even show in your reports. So it's helped a lot with our tracking also. Um, Next up was oh wait, images wanna, and resources. While I'm here, yeah, the, while I'm in web page test, we'll show uh, something else. The film strip view is really awesome. It's basically like when stuff happened. So from zero to four seconds on Moz, we saw nothing. This is, I think, a 3G normal. So someone on a smartphone, average device, moderate connection, uh, for four seconds basically sees nothing. They might leave in that amount of time. Uh, I typically would. <laughs> oh, I, I would, and then I would not work for the next hour or two, so it feels like <laughs> sense too. But even still, we're, we're you know four and a half seconds in and we got 18% of the page. We're six and a half seconds in, we got 32% of the page. Um, 
it's not till eight and a half seconds we have 100% of the above the fold content. That's the stuff that you see in the first screen, basically. <laughs> That's honestly, I mean, it's 3G. Like, yeah. We don't the thing really is, like, no this. one wants to measure in 3G anymore. Like, they're like, no one has 3G, everyone's on Wi-Fi, blah, blah, blah. 70% of the world's connection is still 3G. 70% of internet traffic is still 3G and will be until 2020, 2022. This is the measure that Google is kind of using. They're actually it's saying. The rest of the world. Yeah. That's, so, yeah. Right, that's a good statistic, but it, um, is that that's worldwide then? Do you have any uh, breakdown for like the United States? Yeah, we, if you want an interesting one, um, I mean, these are good diggers for you know sales calls, but uh, we're it's, we're almost we can almost. almost I'm trying to think. States. What is this? Test my I mean, side. Anyway, to look at it, a good rule of thumb is to just, just like build the worst case scenario, right? Like I, I don't ever build anything for like fiber. I, I build it for three G, and so if somebody's on fiber, there's no load time at all. It's just pops yeah. up. I, this I'm, will show you. Um, I'm gonna build it light and fast. Yeah, you want light and fast, but you also don't want to. Uh, that there are trade offs. Uh, that, I, I mean, you can have graceful great. degradation would be yeah. uh, would okay. be a, a better situation. Just as a follow up, um, if somebody asks you, <laughs> I'll send out to a client. Is that uh, where did you get that um, statistic? It was just up there. It's one of the ones from a Google study. Okay. He's trying um, to find a Google study. It, it well, really no, I'm doing the test my site, which will actually pull up. You can segment by connection speed, by country. You can do your site versus others. Oh, it, okay. Uh, it, it all depends on who the audience is for the website itself. I Correct. Mean, there, there's, there's lots of rural areas in North Carolina that will access the same websites as people in Raleigh. There's some people who only in Raleigh will really be interested in the information. Right. Um, it, it's, it really comes down to understanding where the audience is. If, if, they're, if you're really trying to rank across the country everywhere, it starts to become far more important. Yeah, and it's I, it, not just the country. Like, if you're global, yeah. speed is going to be more important. But I'm nowhere near global. I don't know, you can do an 80-20 <laughs> rule. If you don't care about 20% of your traffic, cut it out. If you don't care about 10%, whatever. Um, you know, in my opinion, like, you don't have to be the fastest site in the world. Be faster than your competitors. Yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a, that's a, go, that's why I like standard. Run the the bear, yeah. You just have to run faster than your friends. Just have yeah. to run faster. This yeah. isn't the thing I was looking for. I'll try and find it. But you want to take this back over? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Got, you right, sorry to show it. Like, no, 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 it's it's a fair question. Uh, I just don't want to be um, like if it's in India, you know, or the Africa continent or something like that. Just like, uh, All yeah, right, so let, let's step back to some uh, some easier stuff. Um, Images. Some more more general uh, questions. So, one of the biggest uh, problems, especially now with these giant hero images uh, <laughs> on web pages, um, is just image size. Uh, and there are now so many different ways to improve uh, the speed of your site by optimizing the images. Um, so. You had, what was your favorite? Was it Smush It or which one? If you're on WordPress, Smush It, EWW Image Optimizer. If you are got more control of your server, you can install like Google's page speed stuff. So there's a WordPress mm -hmm. plugin called Smush It, which will do image. Yeah, it's from, it's from the old uh, Yahoo Smush It. So. Yeah. Um, you can also straight up go on Fiverr and pay somebody to just make all of your images smaller and compressed to the right size. Uh, um, I mean, just there are a million ways to accomplish this. If, if you actually go on PageSpeed Insights and run, run one of your pages through there and it says optimize images, there's also a download button for those optimized images. So yeah. download them and PP them onto your server. Bam, you're optimized. Yeah. Congratulations. It does that with JavaScript too. What's that? It does that with JavaScript too. Yes. 
there, there's a number of ways to do it. You can do it at the CDN level. We talked about like Cloudflare, Akamai, whatever. Akamai, if you have the money, does the most amazing stuff. Yeah, they base it on like the initial connection speed and everything. So they'll degrade images, but also optimize them. And yeah, they'll figure out who the person is and decide like, well, we know this person has 2080 vision, so the picture doesn't need to look that good. But there's, I mean, it's almost that amazing. There's APIs you can call to optimize your images. There's plugins or modules, depending on your CMS system. Like, there's, there's almost no reason not to do it these days, because it's pretty much as simple as install something and click go. There's also now uh, code that you can use to give options for what type of image to serve using the picture element which uh, JR included here. So there are certain types of image formats that aren't available in all browsers. Um, and you can basically give both options to the browser, and the browser will default to the one uh, that it can handle. Um, so in this case, uh, he gives an example of uh, a WebP, which is a, a Google, it's Google's um, image. Yeah, um, Google's imp or their version of image compression uh, versus a JPEG. And uh, if the browser that the person is using doesn't accept WebP, it'll just show the JPEG. But if it does, it will show the WebP version. Um, and if I'm correct, uh, it can do it with. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of modern image formats that aren't necessarily sure. supported by all browsers. Mm -hmm. JPEG 2000 is another one. And like, they basically, for the most part, will try to show an image in the right size without losing any quality. Yeah. Because I mean, what's the point of loading like a six megabyte image if it's ten by ten pixels? No one can see six megs of quality in that. So, depending on what size your image actually is on your page, like that's kind of how you should serve it. And so, like, here's another example of where. Uh, someone has used, um, that's actually horrible. <laughs> Take that back. That wasn't what I was looking for. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't find an example of it right now. But basically, um, using that same picture element, uh, you can in your CSS how uh, or, or, um, what images should be called based on the viewport so uh, if you know the maximum width of the page is uh, only you know let's say 480 pixels wide because it's a uh, phone um, then instead of calling the standard image which is 700 pixels wide which will be automatically shifted to the right size by the browser, instead actually call, call one that is um, smaller. Uh, and anyway, there, there are lots and lots of ways to do this, so many more ways than there used to be just two or three years ago. Um, I'm betting you money that JR has uh, <laughs> got this right here, what I was exactly looking for. Um, uh, but you can do it. Oh, no. Calvin, well, I keep losing these bets. I need he to just wants it. to show you a cat. Yeah, that's kind of a weird looking one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, images are a really huge starting point, and, and, and probably the easiest, uh, because even if you don't know how to code, uh, you could simply, like I said, go to a site like Viber dot com and have somebody just optimize your images for you and replace them. Um, and, and that that in and of itself can save you a huge amount of uh, download time. So is this what you were looking for? I think it might be. This is the edit, image that stuck out. Are you trying to pull it up? Mm -hmm. This is the best guy that I know of for image optimization. It's the most comprehensive. Images it's images dot guide. guide. And 
much anything you ever wanted to know about image optimization is <laughs> on this. Yeah. I'm just going to scroll Very through smart it, people and you this. guys just read it really fast. That's what we're doing. <laughs> there we go. It, um, it looks like web page cache uses images that guide stuff because it has the same icon on the top. When yeah, it Patrick yeah. Meenan uh, contributed to this, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Patrick Meenan being the guy that made web page tests who works at Google. That's I'm pretty nice. sure the picture element that you guys were looking at earlier has options for different sizes, which yeah. is what you're talking about. It's just that the source, you can go with multiple different sources and let's explore 50 pixels and we'll yeah. show that. Depending picture. on size, depending on device, yeah. depending on connection yeah. speed, That's which true. one do you get? Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. It, it was a um, random development forum. Google was presenting, um, and uh, the guy was talking about what he had done with WebAssembly. And so one of the things he did was he created a browser app for you to look at various compression techniques and then do a swipe left to right of full, full uncompressed versus compressed. And you know, he basically swiped it over his contents and could see to what degree he compressed without even any loss of visual integrity. Yeah. So it was a pretty, pretty neat tool that he, he just cooked it up with Wood or something. That's one of the things that um, the PageSpeed Insights will show you too. So for the images that aren't compressed, it'll tell you like, here's how much you can actually have in savings. Like this image may be 80K, this image may be 300K. So if you serve an optimized version, you lose no quality, but guess what? It, everything looks the same, but it's a lot smaller. That's a win-win. What are things? scrolling through this. Look how it's <laughs> <one more page. laughs> it is amazing. It's practically a book on image optimization. That's why it's called a guide. One of the things that I see a lot of people miss is we're so used to working in content management system, uh, WordPress or whatever, and, and all of the images that are sitting there that people have uploaded, but within the CSS and the background images, they don't get picked up on a lot of the tools. And so everybody's got their images down to 100K a piece, and then they've got a 12 megabyte background image sitting there that's hard enough for everything. And they so something, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you have to log into FTP. Into like the image gallery and WordPress, it's, it's literally usually uploaded via FTP. Exactly, and a lot of people CSS file. don't deal with FTP that often, so it's one of the big uh, things that people miss nowadays. I've seen that one a lot, haven't you, Pepper? Uh, All right. Okay. So I avoid WordPress, actually. Well, it, neither, I mean, not just WordPress, so many of them. I agree. Uh, more on images. Um, one popular technique, uh, girls in bed. That's my wife telling me that my daughters are asleep now. Oh, is that what it is? Thanks for sharing. It's your white that size. So, uh, yeah. Wait. <laughs> I have to keep a modicum of morality because of my children. Um, a technique that existed for a long time, uh, if you still use HTTP 1 and not HTTP 2, it's really important. And even if you use HTTP 2, it still has some value. It's called spriting, or uh, CSS sprites. Uh, and there is some, uh, this was a great research that was done uh, that showed how it works. But remember when we discussed earlier that you know it downloads one picture and then the next picture and the next picture well, some geniuses came up with the idea of why don't we combine all these pictures together, like all these little buttons and icons into one picture, and then compress it as much as we can, and then we just download that one picture and then use CSS to crop out the little pieces that we need whenever we need each icon. And that way, instead of downloading a thousand pictures in a row, we download one highly compressed picture and then use CSS to show the parts we want. Okay. Um, in fact, Google has a pretty famous sprite. Uh, I don't know how to make you disappear. <laughs> no, that's not what I wanted. Um, yeah, what, 
before HTTP2, browsers tried to like do this for you anyway. Like they, uh, most browsers will actually start like six to eight downloads at once. So even with HTTP 1.1, they would open six to eight connections to a server to try and download multiple files. Like each one of those give me one file. Now each one give me the next file and that kind of thing to try and speed that up. But with HTTP 2, like ideally it just says give me everything and it all starts downloading. Yeah. So this uh, this was Google Sprite changing over time, which is kind of neat to see. Uh, you know, the first Sprite Google had was kind of small, but now it has all of these little things from the the stars, uh, the numbers of stars to half stars to ups and downs and lefts and rights and tiny little icons. And so when you see an icon on Google, um, like in Google's uh, on Google's page, like when you see something like these dots or this, it's probably part of, actually these are probably SVGs, um, but they're part of one of these sprites and they're just cropping off or clipping off everything else in the image. Um, so it only has to download the image once. Correct. Right, one image. One image. And it's cached cool. in, it's in your browser. It's such an easy thing to do if you had a row of pictures. And the cool thing is that you can create uh, sprites. Uh, that's not what we want. Create image sprite. Uh, CSS sprite gen. Um, uh, where, and this one's not going to make it easy for me because you've got to upload your pictures, but you would choose all your files that you want to upload, and then you just lay them out on a grid, and it will then give you the CSS for each one of those little s sprites. Um, so it'll, wherever you want to put that picture. Uh, this one's css.spritegen.com, but there's a better one. Um, I'm trying to find the, the one that I like. Maybe it was Sprite Pal or Sprite Pad. Is it theoretically possible to stack images and sprites together and use this technique on a lot of these scales? Or is that because I mean I know how frequency compression works, and the more data you give them, the you know is there a trade off? But I mean there's resolution problems and what have you. Uh, I I'm I'm not sure. I'm not I, I wouldn't know. Um, typically, it has been used for things like iconography, where you've got tons of little images. Um, similar color palettes. Uh, you know, a lot of the excess waste um, in these tiny images is that you have to download the color palette for each one. Um, yeah, any, anything that's used across multiple pages. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, you know, I want it, for example, if I own the photography website, I want it to make a spread of all of my photos. <laughs> when you hit the home page, that initial download could be yeah, a gig, a gig too button. big. Um, but it, at one point, um, I had a, I want to say a sprite. That's pretty cool. And we'll, the the things that. we're going over are, are usually like the easy wins, too. Like the things that usually affect performance, images are going to be one of the biggest ones. Your JavaScript, your CSS files. What uh, about all the social media icon links? Yeah. Uh, well, that, that would be a perfect use case for the sprites. Right. Yeah. 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 Because <laughs> those things you can buy that gives you all the social media icons. Now, like, most of the time, the uh, if you're like copying and pasting from uh, these various from, from Facebook or from Twitter or whatever, what they want you to put on your page, uh, you know that. The JavaScript there that's going to automatically add the title, you know, when you click on it, uh, but make it so that it'd be more difficult to turn it or to use a sprite. I'm not sure if in some cases that would be possible uh, as a replacement. Um, but be wary that most of the times they embed some sort of tracking in there. That that little image is a beacon so that they can uh, track you as you go around the web. I will say though that. A lot of times when you're using those types of third-party beacons, like a, a, 
Twitter icon, your user already has that cache. They have visited a page that has that exact same icon on it at some point. The same thing's true with Google Analytics. Like the chance that a user is visiting your page and has, has to download the GA JavaScript for the first time is very low. Uh, they've already got it. So there's a couple there's of other things. Offer server size. So yeah. Um, real quick, uh, one thing that people tend not to really pay attention to is just the host quality itself. <laughs> um, like, are you on a good host or a good web host? And how fast is it? Um, it is. Uh, that's not as big of a deal once you install a CDN, um, but it can still be problematic for any kind of dynamically generated content especially content that's updated regularly. If you have a CDN, that CDN is going to learn that every time they fetch your page, it's changing. Let's say you have a blog that you update daily, or, or even more frequently, or you've got a stock ticker or something on your page. Well, if that's database-driven and on, you're on a slow server that, uh, or a non-well-optimized database, then it's going to slow down your site. Uh, so. Uh, at some point, um, it, it might be worth taking the time to sit down with a, 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 either a database engineer or a systems engineer, someone who is uh, uh, more talented um, to just uh, get down to the nuts and bolts. And the easiest way to know you have a problem with that is looking at time to first byte. So in that waterfall um, that we saw earlier, uh, let me see if long time to first byte. Uh, let's see if there's an image of it. There we go. Here's a website where you can see uh, there was a long time to first byte. It took three seconds for it to get to that first byte. Well, chances are what's going on in, in, in this situation is either the server or network latency is just really bad. So maybe they just have uh, the network or the um, hosting company just doesn't have good uh, bandwidth. Or what I find it most commonly is, um, is that the database itself is very poorly optimized. So when it's building that home page's content or that first page's content, it's just taking forever for the database to return all the information it needs. Uh, and, and so it, it's worth examining a little bit further. Sometimes it's more than stuff that you can just change in your HTML or your pictures. It actually requires that you work with a sysadmin or um, someone who works closer to the metal. Uh, do you have a couple of things that you wanted to not Fonts have? would probably be a big one to cover because uh, people are loading Lots of different fonts for lots of different styles. Uh, it can be a big hit, especially if they're like third-party fonts. Yeah. yeah, there is a cool, um, where is the font's name? CSS. I had it. Why did I not see it right now? Do you see up, fonts? Up. It's further up. up. Did a lot of stuff. There we go. We're very ambitious in these. We don't usually get to yeah, cover Yeah, but I put it. Somewhere else, it looks like a bit of a saved or uh, anyway. Uh, for fonts, um, well, that, that's not the um, URL that I wanted to display. Um, I could just show that Moz thing again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are lots of the WAF files. S yeah, so this is what I was going to recommend is the um, uh, Font display swap. So it looks like this. Swap. And basically, what it does is you, when you're listing off the fonts in your CSS, um, uh, you give it a prioritization and you're loading these uh, third party fonts. But what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and render the page with the font that you've already got. And then it's going to swap it out with the new font as soon as it's loaded. And that allows your um, uh, allows your site to 
continue the loading process for users to interact with it um, without having to wait for all of these third party bots to load. Um, Some people don't like that though because it can be like jarring, basically yeah. everything like restyles <laughs> itself all at once. Yeah, the, those people are weak. Well, <laughs> Gmail does that and um, for some reason it holds the browser. That I, actually, I think it works well in Chrome but doesn't in Firefox. Interesting. They, uh, the list of um, all of the um, emails that I've got, that page loads crappy in the beginning, and then uh, it, when it redraws it, it comes in clear. So uh, I think they've. Yeah. They've it, used if the font's similar, space. like maybe it's not going to cause too much of an issue, but if, you know, <laughs> there's some crazy fonts out there. Yeah, the biggest issue would be if it changes interactive portions of the page. So. I'm sure all of you have experienced at one point trying to click on something on your phone and then it changes. <laughs> it moves. Uh, you know, and, and, and there you go, you've got a lawsuit on your hands. Uh, so, so <laughs> what, what font systems would you avoid? Well, what you would want to do is if you're going to use the swap feature, is to make sure that you're swapping out two fonts that are similar enough to one another that it's not going to radically change the page. Um, and if, uh, if, it, if it's not, then just you're going to have to decide whether or not uh, having the unique font on your page is really worth it. Um, I, I personally never really um, felt compelled to use non-standard system fonts. Uh, uh, but it's okay, you're not a designer. I, I started <laughs> off as a designer, and I, I feel like uh, I don't get enough out of it. Uh, but, um, for headlines, but, but not for text. I never but, understood that why there were never enough fonts. <laughs> to choose from millions of fonts. I know, that's millions. what I'm saying. Yeah, I used to buy Adobe's font collection. And it has like two Arial. <laughs> Do you have a question? For those of us who are in print. We're saying cut it off. We're done. Do we have questions? Are we done? Oh, I think we're, we're done. done. No, we're done. Yeah. Yeah. Frank is kicking us out. So oh, yeah, he's going to kick us out. images, JavaScript, CSS, fonts. Those Caching. Those are big delays. Caching. Caching <laughs> will be a big win. Uh, run through some speed <laughs> test tools. They pretty much tell you what to do. These are great. Lighthouse, PageSpeed Insights. They're, they're really telling you, like, do this, do this, do this. There's plugins, there's modules, there's third party things. Um, you know, if, if images is your thing, smush it, EWW, do a CDN level, throw your site on the CDN if you're not there already. I'm going to make one quick pitch. Oh, four. Mondays through Wednesdays, I work here. 10 to 3. Anybody else wants to hang out and talk marketing or whatever? Uh, ask questions. Here. Yeah, because I, I would normally work from home, and it's just boring as hell. <laughs> so, so I've started coming here. Uh, so Thank you guys. It's free. It's free. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. The ground floor is walk-in co-working Monday through Friday it's from uh, 8 to 5. And just completely free walk in. I can live here, basically, is what you're saying. Eight to five, Monday it's through Friday, yeah. It's not as noisy as it was when we came through here, though. Generally correct. Uh, there's the also that whole center area has little conference rooms that you can reserve online through the website. They're free. Use those um, so for having meetings and events. Five, if, you're, if you're around, like if you're quietly in a meeting room or whatever, the guy who's trying to get everybody out by 5 p.m., yeah. he goes around flushing people. Yeah, at five o'clock, so his job is to chase everybody out. Yeah. Well, and be, he starts before five o'clock. He says, yeah. like, hey, are you moving? Yeah, he so starts around 4.30 or so, yeah. telling everybody time to get out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Russ, I will probably take you up on that one. Please do. I mean, I would love to be in a situation where we had, like, a collaborative group of local marketers just getting together. And, okay. uh, what do you say, Monday through Wednesday? I'm Monday, Wednesday. Uh, 